Okay gang, let's take a look at calculating probabilities for the standard normal distribution. Uh, when I say standard normal distribution, all right, you hear normal distribution, you think bell curve, but when I say standard normal, I want you to think bell curve with z-scores. So we had talked about the standard normal curve, but let's just reiterate it. It's this last column on that trait table, at least on the front page of that trait table. So your standard normal has a couple of things that will always happen. Standard normal will always be the bell curve, but instead of having any regular old x variable along your x-axis, it specifically has z-scores. All right, so we will label our x-axis with the letter z, and z's always have the same mean and standard deviation. The mean is always zero, and the standard deviation is always one. And I wrote that here, right? The mean is always zero, the standard deviation is always one. So you know that zero comes below that peak every time, and then we scale our, our z-axis, excuse me, by ones, one, two, and then three, and then negative one, negative two, negative three. And you can see that by the time you go three under the mean and three over the mean, you've pretty much taken care of all of the z-axis, all right? So we're gonna take a look at how to calculate probabilities on the standard normal curve. But before we do that, I just want us to draw a picture, right? So you see these little pictures that I'm gonna have you draw here? I want us to relate our picture to what this number would be. Right? When you see me ask you for a probability, you know it's gonna be a number between zero and one. But let's see if we can get some gut feelings using this picture and connect those ideas. And when I say picture, all right, we talked about how if I ever ask you for a probability, it's area under a curve. This was the second page of your packet. Okay, and we're gonna talk about shading particular areas in here. Here I asked you to shade from one to two, all right? And now we're gonna have you shade, let's see what our particular problem says, ah, negative two to two. So before we go shading, let's scale our z-axis so we have a little bit better idea of what we're working with here. But again, if you have a standard normal curve, or if you see a z in here, right? Not the x variable, but the z, that's something special to us in stats. So we're gonna put z's along the x, probability of z along the y, zero will always go below that peak, right? Now I would scale these by moving one unit each way. So I put a one here and then a two here, and you could put the three here if you wanted. I'm gonna go the other direction, negative one and negative two. And again, if I wanted, I could go all the way to three and negative three. I mean, you could actually go further but you just kind of run out of curve at that point. All right, so if we start inside the parentheses, this is telling you where to start and stop along your z-axis. So it says start at negative two and stop at positive two, right? This is my low to high. So in shade, instead of shading the entire thing, I just wanna shade from negative two to two, and let me shade everything in between that. I look at that, all right, let's, let's remind ourselves of something we picked up earlier, that if I was ever going to shade the total area under this bell curve, the total area of the bell curve should be one. Now, proportionally speaking, I didn't actually shade all of it, but you can see there's a little bit left off here and a little bit left off here. So proportionally speaking, how much did I shade? What proportion of one? Well, to me, that looks like 90%, right? 90, 95%. I shaded almost all of it. So when I get this number, it should be close to 90 or 95%. I'm going to erase those numbers in a moment, but that is my gut feeling that if probability really is area under a curve, and it said shade the area under the curve from negative 2 to 2, I'm thinking that's 90 or 95%. Now, I also mentioned on that front page that we don't have the calculus to actually do this by hand, so we're gonna use our TI-8384 calculators. All right, so if I ever wanna calculate probabilities, we're gonna use our calculator for it. 
So I am going to flip this over to my calculator in a moment, and we're going to figure out what this number is. I'm going to erase this for now because we're going to get the real one in a moment. Okay. So like I said, I'm going to flip over to my calculator, show you how to do that, and then I'm going to flip back to this page. So I'll see you in a bit. Hey Math 43, let's take a look at how we can use our calculators to calculate those probabilities for the standard normal curve. Or at least we'll start with the standard normal curve and then when we move to the regular normal curve, you'll see it's very similar. So in terms of the standard normal, all right, if I want to find the probability that my z-score is between negative 2 and 2, we drew that graph when we were doing it by hand and I think I said it was going to be around 90-95%. I think that was my guess with the one I drew by hand. This one I drew on the computer. It's a little nicer. So how this works is we need to go find a button or a calculator function called normal CDF. And you find it in the same menu that you found binomial PDF and binomial CDF. So let's go to our calculators and hit second and bars. And if you'll remember, binomial PDF and CDF they were options A or B, depending on if you had the TI-83 or TI-84 calculator. The normals, you can see they pop up right away. The normal distribution is by far the most popular distribution in stats, so it's right at the top. Now let's be super clear, you will never use normal PDF. All right, we won't use that in here. We will either use normal CDF or, no, or inverse norm. So you'll use options two or three. When you're calculating probabilities, which I'm asking you to do in this example, you will use normal CDF. When we're doing something that I call the backwards problems, we'll use inverse norm, but we're not there yet. I just want you to know it's coming. So let's hit option number two, so you can either scroll down and hit enter, or just hit the number two, and then you owe your calculator four pieces of information. You owe it your lowest z-score that you shaded, the highest z-score that you shaded, the mean, and the standard deviation. So I'm going to say it again. You owe it a low, high, mean, standard deviation. Oops, I can't get my fourth finger up. Low, high, mean, standard deviation. So four things. I probably should do it this way. Four pieces of information. So let's think about our low and our high. The low and the high come from your z-axis. So these first two numbers are always built on what's inside your parentheses. So you see I shaded from a low z-score of negative 2 to a high z-score of positive 2. So over here, I want to hit negative 2, and then I want to hit the comma key, and then I want to hit positive 2. So whenever you use normal CDF, the first two numbers are always based on what you shaded on your z-axis, if you're dealing with a standard normal curve. Or when we get to any regular old normal curve, it'll be the low and the high of what you shaded on your x-axis. But we're on the z's right now. So low and high of what you shaded on the z-axis. And then you need the mean and the standard deviation. And when you're on the standard normal curve, the mean is always 0 and the standard deviation is always 1. So I'm going to hit comma 0, comma 1, and close that parentheses. All right, so we're going normal CDF, low, high, mean, standard deviation, right? Four pieces of information every single time. And then you just want to hit enter, and there we're getting our 95%. Right? So that's it. I, I think I, like I said, I think I guessed 9095 when I was drawing it by hand. And there it is. I've got my number confirming my graph. And this number, it's pretty large compared to one, right? 95% of one. And I should have shaded 95% of my graph. Uh, one thing I do want to mention here. Let me redo this command and put an intentional typo in, an intentional typo that I see sometimes. So I can hit second and vars. Let's go to two. Sometimes folks will hit the subtraction sign instead of the negative sign. And let me type this in. And then I want to talk about the difference between those two symbols. All right, so when I say the subtraction sign, it's this key over here, the one with all of your math operations, right? Division multiplication, subtraction, and addition. It's different from this negative symbol down here. You can see the negative symbol is a little bit smaller, a little bit higher up in terms of where it hits the number. You can see the, the subtraction symbol is a little bit wider, a little longer, and it's more towards the middle of that number. 
And the thing is, if you hit the subtraction sign, your calculator is going to try and subtract 2 from something, but there's no something over here. So when I do this, it'll pop back a syntax error saying you've made a typo. And if I go to it, if I hit option 2, it's straight saying like, dude, get rid of the subtraction sign. So watch in a moment, I'm going to hit the negative symbol. You'll see just a change in that symbol, right? It got shorter and got raised a little bit. Okay. And one other thing I want to mention, let me clear this out. If you're hitting normal CDF and you're not getting, excuse me, normal CDF and then option two, and you're not getting this screen, it means you probably still haven't changed your mode. Um, we changed our mode a while ago, but it's always a good thing to remember. Um, so I have the old calculator, uh, my actual, uh, the calculator you see me using in the videos. This is an emulator. This is a fancy one. Um, and some of you have the fancier ones also. The TI-83s are old. Some of the TI-84s are old, especially some of the ones I rent out. So if I hit mode here and I scroll down, on this calculator it'll let me have, do it. Make sure classic is highlighted. You might have math print highlighted, but hit classic and then your operating system will look like my operating system. And also make sure your stat wizards are off. So again, if your calculator screen just isn't quite looking like mine, those are some things that you want to focus on. Okay, and if it is looking like mine, just ignore what I said. All right, all right, thanks gang, I'll see ya, bye. Okay gang, we're back. Let's take a look at the calculator command one more time. So whenever you wanna calculate a probability on a normal curve, whether it's the standard normal like it is right now or when we get to later examples, the regular normal, it's still gonna be normal CDF. So we're gonna go normal CDF and then you owe me four numbers every single time. You owe me the lowest number on your z-axis, the highest number on your z-axis, the mean of the standard normal distribution, and the standard deviation of the standard normal distribution. So if we look at our x-axis, I was shading between negative 2 and 2. That is my high and my low. Okay. In terms of these last two numbers, when you are on the standard normal curve, these two numbers are standardized. They are always 0 and 1. So I'm always going to go low, high, mean, standard deviation. And when we're on the standard normal curve, these back two are always 0 and 1. So let's try this on our calculators. All right, so I'm going to go into second and vars. Now, you have a couple of options with the norms, right? You can see 1, 2, and 3 all have the word normal in it. We will never use normal PDF in here. All right, we will always use normal CDF, and when we get there, we'll eventually use inverse norm. So never use option one. All right, we're either gonna use two when we're calculating probabilities, or we'll use option three when we're going backwards. And I'll show you what I mean by going backwards once we get there. So let's go down to normal CDF. We're gonna enter negative two, comma two, comma zero, comma one. All right, and then I'm gonna hit the enter key, and I see 0.954, which is what I was guessing, right? When I looked at this, this is a pretty large percent of that overall curve, which has an area of one. Okay. So the area that I shaded is about 95%. That, that matches my graph. All right. So one other thing I want to mention is the difference between the negative symbol and the subtraction symbol. So when I say the negative symbol, we've got this guy here next to the decimal point. When I said subtraction, it's in here with your linear operations, division, multiplication, subtraction, and addition. So I'm going to push both of these in a moment, and I want us to just talk about the difference between the two and what they look like. So here I'm going to push the negative symbol, the one that I did up here. All right, and now I'm going to push the subtraction symbol. So let's just compare and contrast. You can see the negative symbol, it's a little bit smaller and it's a little bit higher up, right? And the subtraction symbol is a little bit longer and it's towards the middle. So what I mean by that is sometimes I'll get students that they'll put the subtraction symbol here. And just take note, right, this, this, again, this negative symbol is a little bit smaller, a little higher up. Subtraction symbol is a little bit longer and towards the middle of this digit. When you put the subtraction sign here, what your calculator is going to try and do is it's going to try to subtract 2 from something, but there's no something in front of it. So when I hit enter, you're going to see that syntax error pop up. Right? We're not quitters. All right? We might feel like it sometimes. That's okay. That's totally natural, especially with all this probability stuff. But we're going to go to our error, it's a syntax error, it's a typo, and it's telling you right there, hey, I, I can't handle 
this subtraction symbol. So change it to the negative, and then you're good to go. Okay. All right. So with that, let's look at our second type. All right. I'm seeing a probability again. Great. All right. I've got a z-score, so I want to take note that this is z's. That's your indication that you're on the standard normal curve. All right. And once you're on the standard normal curve, you have some information. I can actually start to scale this. I know that z is the label for my x-axis. I know that probability of z is the label for my y-axis. I know zero is under the peak. And now let's think about where negative 1.76 lives. All right, so on my z-axis, if I wanted to head to negative 1.76, I would head left of zero. Right around here is negative one. Right around here is negative two. So I'm thinking that negative 1.76 is right around there. That seems like a good guess. So let me go write that in. Okay, so negative 1.76. And if you want to scale your z-axis, if you want to put the 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, feel free. But I don't need all of them. I want to really take a look at negative 1.76. The less than tells me to shade to the left. So I want the area under this bell curve to the left of a z-score of negative 1.76. Now when I look at this, proportionally speaking, I know the total area under that curve is 1. This looks like a pretty small chunk, right? 5%, 7%, right? it's pretty small. So I'm going to expect a number close to 5 or 7% here. I'm not expecting anything large like this 95%. This should be a much smaller number. Now we're gonna run normal CDF, but I wanna talk about the low and high on the z-axis, and then I'll flip over to my calculator. So let me just draw the z-axis here. I'm gonna erase these two numbers because they're not true. They're just my guesses, and I wanna have a little bit of space right here. Okay, so let me just draw only the z-axis right now. Let's forget about the fact that there's a bell curve on top of it. So here's my z-axis and I'm looking at negative 1.76, and I shaded to the left, all right? And I can shade left forever. If I shaded left forever, we have a symbol for that in math. We call that negative infinity, all right? So if you're going left forever, we're going to negative infinity, all right? So when we go low to high, I wanna go from low of negative infinity to a high on the z-axis of negative 1.76. Right, we move left to right along the z-axis, so I hit negative infinity first, and then I stop at negative 1.76. And I'm going to show you how you enter negative infinity into your calculator. But here's my low, here's my high, I know my mean, and my standard deviation. So I'm going to flip over to the calculator, and then I'll circle back, and I'll, I'll write all this out on here. Hey Math43, we're back with part B. So let's take a look at the probability that z is less than negative 1.76. And as I said on the previous part of the video, you got to think about the first two numbers as the low and high of your z-axis. And low is over here at negative infinity, right? I'm starting all the way over here. This is negative infinity, and I'm going up to negative 1.76. So when we go into our calculator, we're going to hit second in bars. We will never use number one. We're gonna use two or three. And when calculating probabilities, which is what we're doing in example seven, we're gonna use number two. You always need to start with the lowest number you shade on your z-axis, comma, highest number, right? It's low, high, mean, standard deviation, four things. So our lowest number is negative infinity. And there's a special way to input negative infinity into your calculator, and let's make sure we get that down. So enter negative, that'll be for the negative infinity. And what we want to enter is the largest number that your calculator can handle. So here's the largest number. We're gonna do negative one times 10 to the 99th power, right? So exponential, or not exponential, scientific notation here. So negative one times 10 to the 99th. Now how your calculator will handle that is we're gonna do negative one, we're not going to actually hit times 10 with the exponent of 99. Your calculator has scientific notation built into it, and it's here. If you look above your comma key in blue, it's these two letters E, E, E. That's actually scientific notation for your calculator. So I'm going to hit second and E, 
or second and EE. I say E because it pops up one E here. So this is your calculator's notation for scientific notation. We saw this back in the math interlude for chapter two. We've seen it play out in previous chapters, chapter three as well. So I wanna do negative one E nine nine. That symbol right there, negative one E nine nine, that is negative infinity on your calculator. So that's how we're always gonna enter negative infinity. Should that be one of the numbers we have to enter for normal CDF? All right, so I'm gonna go negative infinity, comma, negative 1.76, comma, mean and standard deviation. And when you're on the standard normal curve, the mean is always zero, and the standard deviation is always one. So we've got normal CDF low of negative infinity, high of negative 1.76. These two numbers come from what I shaded on my z-axis, low of negative infinity, high of negative 1.76. The mean is always zero, and the standard deviation is always one when you're on the standard normal distribution. If I hit enter, you'll see that 0.039 pop up, and I screenshotted it here on your key. All right, we're gonna try another one. All right, so the next one we're gonna do, we're gonna do part C, we're gonna see what happens when you have a greater than. All right, see in a few, bye. Okay, so we were just going through, this is still gonna be, it's always normal CDF. We're gonna go low, which will be negative infinity. High, which would be negative 1.76. Mean of zero, standard deviation of one. And again, on the standard normal curve, these last two numbers are standardized. They're always zero and one. So let's try normal CDF. We're gonna go negative one, E99. And I know it's hard to see all these buttons, so I'll push this up for just a moment, but the E you're using, it actually says EE on the calculator. It's over your comma key, and it's blue, so I have to hit the blue button. But I've got negative infinity, negative 1.76, zero and one. When I hit enter, I'm looking at about 4%. And if you remember, I initially guessed 5 or 7%. I actually guessed higher than it was, but we'll go 0.039. But that decimal matches this graph, so that's, that's a fair enough connection, okay? All right, now in terms of remembering all of this, I've got it on that giant trait table. So we are in the standard normal column. The reason we know we're in the standard normal column is because we're looking at z-scores. Anytime you're looking at z-scores, you're on the standard normal distribution. All right, I tell you here, the mean is always zero. The standard deviation is always one. And then I have some notes about probability. It says use normal CDF. And then I give you an example. And with this example, I'm just saying, if you have a less than, all right, you're gonna go normal CDF, negative infinity to that number, zero, one. But this is just for example. I don't want you to think this is always the exact calculator command. If you have a greater than, it would be a different calculator command. It would still be normal CDF, but the low and the high would change. All right, on part A, when we did it, we didn't have any infinities in it, right? We just went negative two to two. So it should always be low, high, mean, standard deviation for normal CDF, but these numbers, these first two, will change just depending on your question. If you're on the standard normal, these last two will always be zero, one. All right, so let's, let's move along from here. Let me scooch this up so we can get part C and D in the picture here. Okay, so I want the probability that Z is greater than 1.18. All right, so as soon as I see Z, that tells me what curve I'm on. I know I'm gonna label my X axis with the letter Z. I'm gonna label my Y axis with probability of Z this time out, all right? And then I'm gonna go ahead and scale my Z axis. I know zero is under the peak. Now this is positive 1.18. So one is about here. So I'm gonna put 1.8 right about there. That seems like a good enough guess for where, whoops, 1.18 is. All right, okay. It also tells me, hey, I want you to go greater than 1.18. So all the Z values greater than 1.18 are to the right. So let's put these, or let's shade right here. All right, and let's get some gut feelings for this. When I look at this number, or this, this 
shaded region, to me, that it's a little bit more than the, oops, we can't see it. It's a little bit more, let me scooch this back down, excuse me. All right, to me, this is a little bit more than the area that I shaded in part B, right? That was about 4%. This looks closer than to 10% to me. So I think I should get a number close to 10% as I'm rolling through this. Now, in terms of my Z axis, if I was just gonna write my Z axis all by itself, All right, and I'll put a little dividing line right here. But if it's at 1.18, and I'm gonna go to the right, we have a symbol for that. We would call that positive infinity, okay? And so I'm gonna flip to my camera. I'm gonna show you how you go low to high with 1.18 and positive infinity, and we're gonna get a number, and I hope that number is close to 10%. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Hey gang, last one we're gonna do here on our calculator off of this screen. Here I wanna use the greater than option, okay? So when I wanna go greater than, I want us to think about what our Z axis would look like in terms of what I'm shading, right? I've got my low of 1.18 and my high of positive infinity. So this one we're going positive infinity. So let's click over to the calculator. We'll go second in VARS, option two, you always use option two when calculating probabilities. My low is 1.18, all right? My high is positive infinity. And positive infinity, in terms of entering it, very similar to negative infinity, just leave off the negative symbol. So instead of negative one E99, I'm gonna use positive one E99, or really I'll just put one E99. And the E comes from second in the comma key, and then I'm going to type in 99. Right. I've got a I've got a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. That's why you just heard me hissing like a snake. I was trying to say standard deviation, but I wasn't supposed to. I was supposed to say mean. So we've got normal CDF 1.18 199901. Right. Low, high, mean, standard deviation. Always those four things you want to enter. The first two entries come from your z-axis. The last two are your mean and standard deviation, which are always zero and always one on the standard normal curve. So when I enter that in, I'm looking at about 0.119, which matched pretty close to my guess. I think my guess was about 10%. So just to reiterate the first three probabilities we've calculated, here is where we had two numbers in our bounds, low to high. So those were the more obvious low and high. We could see it was definitely negative two to positive two. Then it became a little less clear, right? This was a less than version, so we went negative infinity to that number. This was the greater than version, so we went from that number up to positive infinity. So those are the three types of problems you'll run into with any of these normal uh, CDF questions. So you'll, again, you have two boundary points, one boundary point, but it's less than, so you're going negative infinity to that number. Again, one boundary point, but it was greater than, so you're going from that boundary point up to positive infinity. And those are your three options. So we're gonna practice them a little bit more with D, E, and F. I recommend trying it on your own first and then seeing if your, match, if your answers match mine. All right, see you in a few, bye. Okay, so for this one, I'm gonna go normal CDF. Low, high, mean, and standard deviation. So let's see what number I'm getting. I know we just did this on the computer, but it's good to repeat it. So normal CDF, we had low, high, mean, and standard deviation. So we're getting 12%. Okay, I guessed 10. 12 is pretty close. I'll put 0.119 here. And there we go. And so with this, what I would recommend is hitting the pause button. You try and do D, E, and F on your own and see how those go for you. So hit pause. We'll be here still crunching numbers when you get back. All right, but let's try D. All right, so part D, I've still got the 1.18. I see the Z-score, so let me go ahead and scale and label my axes. So I'm gonna go 
right around that 1.18, right around pretty close to, well, hopefully exactly close to what I drew in part C. But I'm going by hand, so I'm not perfect. This time I would like to go to the left. I would like to go less than. Now looking at that, that looks to me about 90% of my graph. That's, that's a good chunk. It's not as much as this, but it's a pretty sizable chunk. But again, in terms of low to high, if I think about this, I'm going all the way down to negative infinity. Negative infinity is my lowest number. So when I go to run normal CDF, all right, negative infinity is my lowest number. 1.18 is my highest number, again, on the z-axis, right? The z-axis I shaded from negative infinity to 1.18. The last two are always 0 and 1 because the mean for the standard normal curve is always 0. The standard deviation of the standard normal curve is always 1. So let's go crunch this one. So I'll go normal CDF. Um, which way were we going? Oh, negative 1.899, excuse me. 1.18, 0, and 1. When I crunch that, I'm getting about 0. 0.881. And before we move on to the last two, I just want you to take note of these two numbers. What do they add up to? All right, if I took on my calculator 0. 0.881 and added 0. 0.119 to it, you see I'm getting 1. That's because these are complements, right? A z-score is either greater than 1.18 or it's less than 1.18. So if I had wanted to, if I knew this number, I could have subtracted it from one and gotten that number, complement rule. All right, I'm gonna scooch this up so that we can see E and F. Okay, so let me move that. There we go, so let's try and do E and F. So here I'm going, okay, I see the Z's. I got a probability. I know I'm going to go area under a curve. Now 1.96, it's pretty far over. So I would go one and then maybe two. So maybe 1.96 is here. There's really not much to the right of it. And I want to go to the right of it because it's greater than or equal to. That is a pretty small number. I'm thinking two, three percent, maybe. So let's try this. This is gonna be normal CDF. We're gonna go low of 1.96. I'm going all the way to the right to positive infinity. My mean is zero and my standard deviation is one. All right, let's see what we're getting here. It looks like I'm getting, yeah, a pretty small number, 0 0.025. That seems about right. I thought I would get two or three percent just because of how little I was shading. All right. Now this one's a little different. This is just straight up saying Z equals 1.23. Okay, we can graph this. So I'm on the standard normal curve. I'm gonna go to about 1.23. Now, there's no area to shade because I'm just stuck at 1.23. I don't have any interval down here. So this becomes normal CDF, low of 1.23, high of 1.23, zero and one. Okay. So as we look at this, let's take normal CDF. I got 1.23, 1.23, zero and one. We get zero. And we got to talk about this, all right? So the likelihood that you get a z-score of exactly 1.23 never happens. So this equals to symbol, anytime you have an equal to symbol, there is no probability associated with that. If you have taken calculus and you remember from your calculus days that the antiderivative 
from a to a of f of x dx equals zero every single time when the limits of integration are the same, this answer is always zero. That's what's playing out here. There is no area under this curve because there was no area I was shading along the z-axis. And the consequence of that, where that really plays itself out for us is here. So for any two numbers, a and b, I don't care if this symbol is less than or equal to or less than, or if this symbol is less than or equal to or less than, or any combinations of these. Because the equals to, all right, because these equal to's, wherever they line up here, don't add any area under the curve, they don't change the value of the probability. Because again, probability is area under a curve. There's no area under curve with an equals to. So less than or equal to versus less than makes no difference in continuous land. And I wanna be specific, this is for continuous random variables. In the discrete, in chapter four, specifically with the binomials, it makes all the difference in the world. But on continuous land, the symbol of less than versus less than or equal to makes no difference. So what I'm saying here is if in part E, I had asked you for the probability that Z was greater than just 1.96, not greater than or equal to, you still would have gotten 0.025. The greater than or equal to makes no bearing on the greater, or makes no difference than the greater than because the equals to adds zero, right? We're adding zero, which means we're adding nothing to this probability. All right, gang, so we're going we're gonna to take a look at any regular normal curve in a moment and learn how to um, calculate probabilities with those. I'll see you in a bit. Bye.